Hi everybody, it's Katie, back with another episode of my vlog, and it's Sunday, so it's time for the Cinema Club Sunday Roundup. We started last week on Sunday, on the wrong day of the week, uh, but it's alright, you guys will forgive me, we had to show the kids Friday. And I do think you should watch Friday on a Friday, if you can, because I'm like that, but Sean picked it last Sunday, and I wasn't about to say no, because Friday is one of my favorite movies from Ice Cube's catalog. Um, you guys may not know this, but Ice Cube actually wrote the movie. It was the third movie he wrote. He had uh, done some earlier treatments for things, but they didn't kind of go anywhere. And um, he wrote Friday as a response to movies like Boys in the Hood, um, which of course he's in, um, and Colors, which show the hood as, you know, this very negative, very horrible place. And he, his intention with Friday was to say, look, it's not all bad. We had a lot of fun. Crazy stuff goes on. There's a lot of great stuff also about growing up in this type of neighborhood. Um, and so he wrote Friday and apparently he pulled a lot of the little bits and stories from actual real life, uh, you know, things that either happened to him growing up or to people that he knew. Apparently uh, getting fired on your day off was something that happened to like one of his cousins. Um, anyhow, uh, Friday. Have you guys seen it? If you haven't seen it, it's required viewing. Um, it's a great, uh, almost no story about two friends just hanging out on a Friday in their neighborhood, um, trying to get high, uh, Ice Cube's character has just been fired from his job on his day off and he doesn't know what he's going to do. Um, and it, it, there's not really much plot there, but you don't really need that much plot for this movie. Um, it's pretty great. It's pretty funny. Um, of course, it spawned a couple of sequels. It's a whole, I guess, the franchise at this point. Um, it's just a great movie. Uh, it was the first movie directed by F. Gary Gray, who had done... Um, uh, music videos prior to that, including several music videos with Ice Cube. Um, and it is very well directed. It's very funny. It's very well acted, especially, um, Ice Cube and Chris Tucker are both hilarious. Um, Tiny Lister is of course great as Debo. Uh, John Williamson is in it. Bernie Mac is in it. Tons of people, um, that you know and love are in it and they're totally hilarious. Um, if you didn't know, it's also the origin of the by Felicia meme. Uh, that is where that line originally comes from in a pretty minor scene, but, um, just a little piece of Friday trivia for you. So Friday recommended. If you like any of the things that I just talked about, I'm gonna keep that one short and sweet because I don't want to tell you too much about what happens in it. If you haven't seen it, you should see it. Um, the next day was August 18th, which is the day that we try to watch the Texas Chainsaw Massacre because that's the day that it supposedly took place. Um, of course, it didn't really take place at all, despite the fact that Toby Hooper opens the movie with, this is a true story. Um, the whole thing is a lie and a fabrication, but boy, what an incredible movie. Uh, one of the greatest slasher movies of all time. Um, one of the really early slasher movies that really kind of set the tone for the genre. But despite the fact that it is a massacre and it's about cannibals, spoiler alert, um, and it's a slasher, it's actually very low gore. Um, almost all of the violence in the movie is implied instead of actually shown on screen, which is pretty cool. Um, but there's a lot of stuff to make you go Ooh, about in watching this movie, um, beginning with the creepy scene with the hitchhiker in the van before they even get to the house. Um, so incredibly low budget movie uh, made by Hooper and some other folks that he had gone to school with originally. Um, it's one of the greatest horror movies of all time. This is another one I don't want to say too much about because if I start getting into the detail level about the reasons why I like this movie, I'm going to wind up spoiling it. Um, it does have one of the most incredible endings of any horror movie I have ever seen. It is such a good ending. Um, I'm not going to say more about what the ending is than that. Um, I do know uh, because it was done on such a small budget, it was, you know, very uh, by the seat of their pants, just sort of anything that works. Um, and if you read up about the uh, history of the making of the movie, they were um, out there in the Texas heat in the summer shooting these incredibly long days, seven days a week. Um, they weren't laundering the costumes because they didn't want to change like the blood stains and the colors of the costumes. So you have to imagine like um, Leatherface going around in his hot, very hot costume, just getting sweatier and nastier and awfuler and whew, sounds like it was not a fun production to work on. Uh, Toby Hooper himself has said that everyone who worked on the movie had some kind of grudge with him after the end of the movie that it took them some time to get over. So apparently it was a very challenging production to be part of, but 
What a movie. What a piece of film history. Um, if you haven't seen it and you're into horror, see it immediately. You have to see it. Um, along with its direct sequel. The second one, uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2, is amazing. Um, I don't really like any of the other stuff that's in the, you know, the sequels and the franchise and the remakes and all of that stuff. But those first two movies together, man, the first one by itself and then the second one also, whew, it would be a great double bill. We, in fact, tried to make it a double bill, but we couldn't find Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2 available streaming anywhere. Can you guys find it for me? Because, man, I was pretty bummed. The kids were ready for the full double feature, and <sighs> we didn't get to do it. Um, not much else to say about this one. It's a Stone Cold classic. It's required viewing if you are a horror person. If you're not a horror person, this movie is clearly not going to be for you. But if you're a horror person and for some reason you've never seen Texas Chainsaw Massacre or you've just thought, oh, it's older, it's cheesy, whatever, mm -mm -mm -mm. you definitely need to see it. Um, the next night after that was Wednesday and we continued with our Western Wednesday theme. In fact, we actually concluded the original list of 13 movies that we made with, uh, 1970s El Topo, uh, of course, directed by, written by, starring Alejandro Jodorowsky. Um, it is like an acid Western. It is so wild and incredible and has so many cool visual things and ideas and pieces of dialogue and just weirdness going on in it. But man, if you've never seen one of Jodorowsky's movies, it's a whole genre unto itself. Um, the kids liked the movie. They were a little confused by it. We had to stop in a couple places and explain some things um, because it's shot in Spanish with subtitles, because it deals with a lot of um, esoteric stuff, uh, Christian symbolism, um, Eastern spiritual themes. Um, if you aren't well versed in those topics, I think you could get lost trying to watch this movie. Um, that's not to say that you can't watch it if you don't already um, speak those visual languages, but there's a lot of places where there's no dialogue and you're left to kind of figure out what's going on. And it was clear to me, um, especially watching it with a 10 year old and a 12 year old, you know, there were a lot of gaps for them and I had to kind of fill in and go through and explain for them what was happening there. Um, it does feel a little bit like two movies put together into one. There's a big transition that happens right in the middle of the movie and it goes from being this story about El Topo, which means the mole, um, who is this gunslinger traveling around in the desert and he has been kind of tasked with this idea of going around the desert and finding and defeating the four greatest gun masters in the desert. And so he does this. And as he meets each one, he learns something from each one. And there's different symbolism, of course, at each uh, gun masters uh, kind of hideout. And he goes through these four different battles and uses, um, you know, trickery and luck and learning something from the gun master in order to defeat him types of themes. Um, and then when he attempts to battle the fourth gun master, um, something kind of tricky happens. I won't say what, uh, but he winds up buried underground in this cave for years and years and years. And then um, kind of wakes up and he's been taken care of by this group of like dwarves and uh, deformed people and just, generally freaks. There's a, uh, like kind of a combo character. That's a guy with no, uh, legs riding on the back of a guy with no arms. Um, so that, that, that's a couple of the characters from this sort of part of the movie to give you an idea of who's there. Um, and the second half of the movie becomes this kind of story about El Topo in his new role. He's no longer a gunslinger. He's now, uh, uh, almost a monk, but he's kind of battling against, um, these weird esoteric cultists in this town. And so, you know, he's doing his thing, they're doing their thing. Um, then his son, oh, forgot to mention he had a son at the beginning of the movie who he gave to some monks. Um, his son comes back at the end of the movie as an adult and meets back up with his father and is intending to kill his father, but a whole bunch of stuff happens. And I'm not going to say what the end of the movie is, but there's a lot 
going on in this movie. It is like so many Jodorowsky movies, it's like an onion and you can just start peeling away layers. And you know, if you want to just look at the visual, or you want to just think about like, oh, the Christian symbolism that's going on over here, or oh, what's, you know, the, the surface level of the story versus what, you know, is the thing that you're not being told that's going on. Um, there's just a lot there. They are incredible films. Um, I have loved every film of his that I've seen. I have not seen all of them, but I've seen the kind of biggest, most uh, popular ones. Um, it, it, he's just an amazing artist. Um, if you are into his style, you will love this movie. If you've never seen a Jodorowsky movie, I would actually recommend El Topo as your introduction to his work. Um, I feel like it's a little bit easier than stuff like The Holy Mountain or Santa Sangre, which get like even crazier. Um, but it's definitely not a, um, like a casual viewing situation. This isn't a movie, not that I ever recommend distracted viewing, but like you're really not going to understand what is happening if you're trying to do something else at the same time as you're watching this movie. Um, you guys know I do knit while I watch movies. Sometimes this is definitely not a knitting while you watch type of movie. Um, so El Tobo, incredible. Two thumbs way up. Again, a little bit confusing if you don't quite understand all of the stuff that's going into it. But if you're curious about it, if you're interested in the stuff that I just talked about, I definitely recommend watching it. You know, if there's something that doesn't make sense to you in the movie, you can always look stuff up online afterwards. You can always watch the movie again. That's the great thing about streaming, right? Um, but I, I'm a huge fan of Jodorowsky's work and I love El Topo. It's a great movie. Um, trigger warning, there is a rape scene in the movie, um, but it's not super graphic. So just to put that out there. Um, the next night after uh, El Topo, we decided to take a spin around on Criterion Channel and just see, you know, what are they promoting right now? And they actually have a, um, a collection that they're calling Bad Vacations, which is what you think Bad Vacations means, um, and includes a bunch of great titles. And we were kind of spinning through that. And we found a film called The Deep from 1977. Um, it's a... Uh, interpretation of a Peter Benchley novel. Now, Peter Benchley wrote the novel of Jaws, and it's also starring Robert Shaw, who plays Quint in Jaws, and it's also a movie that takes place in the water. Um, it has nothing to do with Jaws. There's no similarities other than all that stuff I just said. Um, so it's kind of like a lot of people who brought you Jaws bring you another watery, uh, action-y adventure movie. Um, Nick Nolte and Jacqueline Bissett play a couple who are, um, on a vacation in the Bahamas and they go diving and they find a shipwreck and inside the shipwreck, they find a bottle of morphine and like a Spanish medallion from a sunken treasure ship. What? Uh, so they go back up on land. They talk to Robert Shaw's character, who is a like lighthouse keeper slash treasure hunter, which is, I mean, that's just great. Um, and they realize what's going on. They kind of put it together that there is a sunken World War II munitions ship that's full of unexploded bombs and bottles of morphine because it also had medical supplies. So there's this great treasure down there of all the drugs, but there's also this super dangerous thing of it's full of bombs. Uh, but then somehow due to, you know, tides and storms and whatever, this shipwreck is also on top of another shipwreck, which is a much older, uh, like a Spanish treasure ship. And they're finding like gold medallions and stuff like that. So uh, obviously everybody wants to get at the treasure that's inside this ship. They want to keep it a secret. There are some local gangster drug dealer bosses who really want the morphine out of the ship. They are using voodoo and a bunch of other stuff to try and intimidate uh, the main characters into, you know, getting the stuff for them. Um, meanwhile, uh, Nick Nolte and Jacqueline Bissett's characters, they, they just kind of like want to do the drug dealer thing to appease those guys so they can get at this like crazy treasure ship. Um, so lots of uh, different, you know, forces there pulling against each other. Um, and it's got a pretty decent uh, action structure, um, some fairly tense scenes, a lot of really, really, really A plus underwater photography. Um, the opening is the, the, the two main characters just diving and finding the initial shipwreck. And it's great. It's some of the beautiful, beautiful underwater photography. Some of the most amazing 
um, you know, for the year, for the time period, 1977, um, it just looks fantastic. And then there are scenes later in the movie where they're inside the shipwreck and it's very tense. You know, someone is being attacked by an animal or loses their air supply or whatever. Um, and those scenes are very well done as well. Very, very tense, very scary um, underwater action scenes. So um, it's kind of interesting. Uh, I don't know if it's a great movie, uh, but it was a pretty solid action movie uh, for the, the, the type that came out in the 70s. Um, it's, I would say it's, I'd give it a pretty high grade for that, but it doesn't seem like it's aged that well or people have really remembered it over time. Um, but I thought it was great. Um, it was uh, good performances from all of the actors. And like I said, effectively both beautiful and pretty suspenseful and uh, some good action sequences. Um, you know, maybe a little bit of a cheesy wrap up at the ending, but well, it happens with movies sometimes as you know. Um, oh, and Eli Wallach shows up in later in the movie uh, as a pretty fun character. And that was fun because, of course, we just saw him in The Good, The Bad and The Ugly just a few weeks ago. So the kids were like, hey, so uh, that was fun. Um, and then we concluded our week last night with Scared Stiff, the 1953 Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis comedy classic. This is one of my favorite movies, you guys. Um, years ago, Sean's mom gave us a DVD box set of a bunch of different Martin and Lewis movies, and we watched all of them, and they're all funny, but boy, Scared Stiff is just so much better than any of the other ones that were in that box set. Uh, the basic plot is the two of them are working at a nightclub. There's some, you know, uh, action happens with some gangsters at the nightclub. Dean Martin's character thinks that he's murdered somebody. He hasn't, but he thinks that he shot this guy. And so he's got to flee and escape, you know, being caught for this murder. And then he accidentally winds up getting on this boat bound for um, Havana. And uh, Jerry Lewis is along with him because of, you know, one thing or another with this uh, escape thing that he does. And so then the two of them are on this boat to Havana. There's a woman, her name is Mary. She is, uh, has inherited a castle on an island near Cuba, but it's like, it's very scary and nobody wants to go to the island and everybody keeps telling her she just needs to sell that castle because it's too scary, it's too haunted. Um, so Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis, now they're en route to Havana accidentally, um, agree to go with her to the island and check it out with her and make sure that, you know, it's okay, whatever. Dean Martin's got a little budding romance going on with her. That's his motivation. Jerry Lewis is just being dragged along um, with him. They run into Carmen Miranda on the boat en route to Havana. She's the onboard entertainment, and she knows them previously um, because they worked in nightclubs in the story. And so she ropes them into her stage show on board the, sh the ship and then gets them a gig when they get to Havana. And there is a great scene at the nightclub in Havana where um, first it looks like Carmen Miranda isn't going to show up to perform. And so Jerry Lewis comes out in Carmen Miranda's signature outfit. He's got the fruit on his head. He's got one of her dresses on. And Dean Martin is manning a record player. And Jerry Lewis has to sing and dance along with this. You know, he's basically lip syncing in drag to a Carmen Miranda number, which is incredibly funny. Um, and that's the opening for their real act, which is Carmen Miranda finally gets to the club a little bit late and they sing this song about the enchilada man. And that's the whole reason why we watched the movie last night was Henry made enchiladas for dinner. And I was like, well, we got to watch the enchilada man. Um, so like so many Dean Martin movies, this one is a musical um, and he's an incredible singer, of course. Um, but this one song where he, Dino does the first verse of the song and then Carmen Miranda does the second verse of the song. And then Jerry Lewis in his comedy styling does the third verse of the song. And it's just fantastic. It's a great musical number all by itself, but right in the middle of this movie, it's really pretty fun. Um, then our heroes finally make it to the haunted island uh, to check out this castle that this lady has inherited. And the whole thing turns into this kind of like screwball, Scooby-Doo adventure at that point where it's, uh, you know, maybe not real ghosts at this castle. Maybe there's a guy who's trying to get the castle and is trying to scare our heroes away by using fake ghosts. I'm not going to tell you guys because I want you to watch the movie. I will tell you there's a cameo at the very end. Um, uh, Bob Hope and Bing Crosby show up in the movie, and we had to explain to the kids who those guys were. But um, 
Other than that one little weird piece of stuff, which again, it's still funny if you don't know who they are, but it's funnier if you do know who they are. Um, I think this is still very um, fresh and accessible for people now, even though it's, you know, uh, almost 70 years old. Um, it holds up incredibly well. It's very funny. It's um, very well done, good acting, good performances from everyone. Um, it's a great movie, Scared Stiff. I would normally recommend it during your, uh, you know, Halloween viewing season as it is sort of on that wavelength. Um, but we watch horror all year round or around here, as you guys know. So, um, and I know a lot of people don't like Jerry Lewis uh, and his particular shtick that he does, but I myself love Jerry Lewis. So um, no negative comments about Jerry Lewis on my video, please. I don't really want to hear it if you hate the guy. Um, you can keep it to yourself. <laughs> All right, that is it for what we watched this week. Um, I don't know what's coming up next week. Like I said, we got to the end of our Western Wednesday list. I think we're going to continue, but we don't have like a structured list anymore. I think I'm going to show the kids Westworld, the movie, not the HBO show, because um, that's one that I've been waiting to show them for a while. And we did just catch uh, Yul Brynner and the Magnificent Seven. So that's a great one to follow up with. But I'm not positive. But you guys can stay tuned and find out what Western we wind up watching next week. I also do feel like since we've opened the door to Jodorowsky, um, I'd like to show the kids the Holy Mountains sometime soon, but probably not in the next week. That's that's when you don't want to like double them up too fast. You know, like let let each one kind of have its own space to breathe in and then watch another of his films because yeah, they're like that. Um, all right, uh, I'm going to conclude it here. As usual, I would love to hear uh, what you guys watched this last week or what you have plans to watch next week coming up. Also, have any of you thought about doing this um, renting out an entire movie theater thing that's going on right now? I have heard several movie theaters are doing this thing where it's like if you pay $150 or $200, you can rent the whole theater and you can have like 20 people in there and watch any movie you want. So... Definitely something that I've been interested in. I don't know if we're going to do it, but maybe some of you guys have thought about this. Who knows? I miss movie theaters. Can you tell? <sighs> Starting to wish I had gotten a bigger TV back in December, but oh well. Who knew that this was going to happen? All right, I'm really going to go now. I will be back in a couple days with another episode of my vlog. Until then, everybody stay safe, take care, and thank you so much for watching.